I would love to introduce Jenny Schillingstein. Jenny is um, a co-founder and the executive director of the Draper Richards Foundation. Um, she attended the Stanford GSB, and I think Amherst before that, so she's got bi-coastal, I don't know where before that, um, and uh, had a career, um, a varied career in business, and then has been with Draper Richards since 2002, and is going to delve into the work of the foundation, but among the many hats that I'm sure are on her hat rack in her job there, um, one of them is sitting on many of the boards that, uh, that Draper Richards has funded. So she has a whole diversity of perspectives um, ranging all the way from the Draper Richards work out to the work of the various organizations. And with that, Jenny, thank you so much for being here. And My pleasure. The floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've been a big fan of SV2 for a long time. I remember when it came about and um, when we were coming up with the concept for the Draper Richards Foundation, we were talking to various folks who were doing engaged philanthropy and networked in the field. And so SV2 was very helpful to us, actually, when we got started. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our work. And um, maybe we have to 1.30. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll just talk for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And then since you guys are so um, knowledgeable about pieces of this, then we'll go with your questions so that you get answered. Um, uh, so the idea for Draper Richards was purely born out of venture capital. Um, it, um, the co-founders, Bill Draper and Robin Richards, had started a fund together in India called Draper International, and then subsequently started a domestic technology fund called Draper Richards. And they decided that every company that was sold to Microsoft, the money would go into a foundation. And they had put money, <laughs> they had put money into Hotmail and uh, down the road actually um, Skype, which was not sold to Microsoft but was sold to eBay, and that's what's funding us today. Um, we actually have four um, original founders, um, four original funders, but Bill and Robin really are the the main funders of what we're calling the Founders Fund at Draper Richards. Um, and I'll tell you about the, the philosophy. We um, select, fund, and support early stage social entrepreneurs. All US based, but they do their work uh, all over the world. About 66% of our um, organizations are international, 40 something percent are domestic, and then there's about Oh, that's going to add up to the wrong number. <laughs> Hang on. Because we just recently created a global category. OK, so this is kind of 44% domestic, 36% international, and 20% uh, global. So an example of a global organization would be Kiva.org, uh, America Broad Media, um, Global Health Corps, uh, uh, um, uh, Global Citizen Year. So these are organizations that you could, they're benefiting Americans and they're be um, benefiting people around the world. And we had to sort of make that distinction, otherwise we got a little lopsided. Um, we couldn't decide where to put them. Um, we concentrate on three things in our due diligence process. The number one thing we look at is the leader of the organization. And we look for a variety of characteristics that they have, decision-making capabilities, judgments, um, we look for people who are learners, people who um, uh, draw people to them, the magnetism, they need board members and funders and volunteers and staff people. Um, and so they have to have that charisma and the magnetism. Um, we, we look for folks who um, take challenges in a positive way, they roll with the punches, they see, they get out of a funder meeting and someone says no, and they say, wasn't that a great meeting? Now I, now I know how to pitch the next person, or you know, now I'm, I'm gonna go back to them in six months, and you know, I'm energized by that, um, that I had that conversation rather than defeated by it. Um, and, uh, but we look for people who are also really ruthless with their need to achieve results and to scale. So um, if any of you are familiar with the organization called Room to Read, um, John Wood, the founder, has been known to fire um, volunteers <laughs> for non-performance and um, or to sit in with a funder at the third or fourth lunch and say, if you're not going to fund us, you're wasting my time. 
And I love that because I think that the world of philanthropy is so tipped in the power of the philanthropist and, and tipped away from the people really doing the hard work, in my opinion, um, that I, I think, you know, they know what they know that they're doing hard work. And I think that they deserve more, um, more of our attention rather than less and a lot of respect for so so I like our entrepreneurs to sort of demand be polite but to demand and to know that they're doing important work um, so the leader is the number one thing the second thing that we look for is a model that we think can have sustainable impact um, I don't mean the sustainable organization per se although we're seeing a lot of that and we can talk about that but I we do mean impact that is not a handout um, the organizations we fund tend to be um, tend to provide jobs to people, or, or they tend to fix a system, or they tend to train people in something. So a little bit of that sort of bootstrap kind of attitude that where you know the organization can get in and work with people, and the people can then help themselves once the organization moves on to their next location. Um, and the third piece that we look for that probably distinguishes us from most. Uh, philanthropies is that we look for models that scale and that are not um, local in nature. Most philanthropy is, uh, most nonprofits work locally for good reason. Um, and they should be very personal and very engaged in the community. And that's really where, you know, the bulk of the work is in the world. Um, but we were born from venture capitalists and we can't stand to not um, grow and make things grow. And so we've decided to pick a niche where we're looking for organizations that um, grow. And we did some really interesting research this summer on our organizations that I'll share with you as I go along. But our most successful organizations scale more quickly and on a leaner budget and in fewer years than our less successful ones. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a hurry up um, uh, if you're going to ever sort of make it big, which um, is not always intuitive for a board who is worried about cash flow and is worried about um, keeping their fiscal responsibility. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, so I've touched a little bit on our selection process. Our funding um, in our Founders Fund is um, always the same. And that's unusual too. Um, it's always the same because these are startups and um, uh, there anyway it's 300,000 over three years so it's a hundred thousand a year and um, our organizations by the third year with us um, that's a diminishing amount of their budget and that's how we end up moving towards a an exit because they are raising significantly more money by our third year and we're planning our exit um, with them so um, that has worked really well. And the money is unrestricted. We feel very strongly about unrestricted multi-year funding. We would never fund any other way. And um, our payments are performance-based. And we can talk um, about our um, process of um, working with our organizations to develop milestones. So they write three-year milestones, which are a series of operational and um, outcome measurements that we review quarterly with them, and um, our payments are released based on uh, performance. So I've talked a little bit about our due diligence, a little bit about our funding, and the third piece of our triangle is our support. And our support comes in a few ways. Um, the first thing that we do is we, um, the, our due diligence process is the precursor to our relationship with the organizations. And, and all of you have experienced this if you've been on a re grant review committee for SB2. Um, so through that process, you become uh, very knowledgeable about the organization. Um, and our process lasts anywhere from five, five months to a year. It used to be shorter um, sometimes, but um, it depends actually on the readiness of the organization to present a three-year plan. Um, and through that process, we meet with the entrepreneur or the entrepreneurial team three, four, or five times. And we probably do anywhere from 12 to 20 due diligence meetings or calls, um, both on the leader and on the model and the organization. And we reach into our networks for people 
um, that are experts in the field. We fund any topic, so we need to have a very deep bench of uh, practitioners, um, philanthropists, business people who understand those markets and those geographies, and that's what we lean on. Um, and we get to know them through that process. So by the time we fund them, um, we are by far their most uh, knowledgeable board member. Um, and they're probably the, their most supportive and active board member. So we take a board seat for three years during the life of the grant. Um, we work with them in between board meetings quite a bit on topics such as um, board development, fundraising, systems and measurement, hiring, um, strategy. So really core infrastructure work that is often hard to find you know, on a, from a funder. Funders usually don't. Um, think about those things, they don't care about them. They're not in their strategy. Their strategy is to improve education or their strategy is to improve the environment. And our strategy is to build great organizations. So that's all, that's all we do. Um, in addition to, we know you're doing great work, but there's going to be a lot of other funders who help you with that. And what we're trying to help you with is to build an organization that can last and can do increasingly hot, effective work around the world. And we also bring our organizations together in a leadership network. So all of our entrepreneurs are invited once a year to a conference. We've um, traditionally done it in the Bay Area for three days where they come together and hear from experts and hear from each other. Um, that, that got um, remarkably interesting when we had about 12 organizations in our portfolio. I think it was sort of the magical spot. We have 25 in our um, portfolio right now. Um, we have funded 28, but three are gone, and we can talk about failure. Um, but it is a remarkable network of people. We meet throughout the year on the phone on conference calls around a particular topic that we've heard is important to them, and they mentor each other, not in a formal way. We've kept it very informal, but for instance, um, uh, John Wood from Room to Read sits on the board of One Acre Fund. And One Acre Fund, Andrew Yoon, is an advisor to Tavis Howard at Kamaza. And there is this remarkable sort of generational learning that's happening where they're trying not to make the same mistakes that they made before. And they're really interested in coming together and saying, you know, this is what I learned. Had I known this, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, this is what I would have done. And that is really a remarkable um, a remarkable thing to see. Um, all right, I want to make sure I tell you a little bit about our portfolio. Um, like I said, we've, we've funded 28 organizations, 25 are still around. Um, the, we've ended up funding a variety of topics. We're um, topic agnostic, and that allows us to do a lot of innovative models that have their they don't really fit neatly into one bucket or another. Are they economic development? Are they health? Well, they're, well, they're both. Um, and we find those to be really exciting. And if you think about living goods, they're going door to door selling medical products. Well, that's where does that fit? And, and, and how do we classify that? Um, we don't care. Um, but the topics were, we ended up in um, health, education, human rights, economic development, and um, what's our fifth? Well, something important. Um, we desperately uh, need and want something in the environment. So uh, the environment, uh, domestic K-12 education, U.S. is very tough for us in our model. It doesn't grow uh, quickly and uh, very tough to make uh, revs on the model. You have to wait a whole year before you can try anything new and uh, very, um, very expensive. All our domestics have a tough time scaling because going city to city is quite expensive. And, um, and uh, environment has trouble because it is very resource intensive on a very singular idea um, or it is very, um, in our opinion, it's not, um, it's too light. It's like a website that teaches kids about the pandas, and which is great. It's just we're, we're into some really meaty poverty issues, and I think we're looking for something that 
can scale, but also we think is really creating core change um, for the environment. So if you see something, um, we would we'll love to see everything. You know, anything. Um, let's see, what can I tell you? Um, our organizations, the year before we fund them, have about a hundred and forty thousand dollar budget on average, but it goes up to as much as it's gone up as much as four hundred thousand, four hundred fifty thousand. We funded. And by the third year with us, they're at a $1.4 million budget on average, um, which is 10x growth, uh, which surprised, surprised us quite a bit. And um, the average of our portfolio now is $4 million um, of our um, later stage ones. So ones between four and eight years old with us, um, it's a $4 million budget. And that, that includes Room 3 to the $24 million budget, Kiva at a $7 million budget, and but um, we think there's something very special that happens in an infrastructure of an organization around, I'm still digging in the numbers a little bit, but I think it's right around $800,000 where an organization can afford uh, a couple senior managers, they can afford, um, a good, they can afford to have um, a good system in place. They're starting most likely to use Salesforce to track donors and to track um, stats on their on their program they're starting to be able to cycle through um, improving their program using statistics and they're getting more savvy about setting those up from day one um, they um, hopefully are starting to get open to the idea of having an executive coach we've seen unbelievable statistical I would well we have 24 organizations so I'm not going to say statistically significant but we are seeing a high correlation between our most successful entrepreneurs and using an executive coach. Um, and so we, we feel very strongly about them getting up to about that million dollar level pretty quickly because it does mean that they are able to then ready themselves for the next stage. So we're very happy about um, those results. And then in terms of impact, which is our most important thing that we look at, um, there is not an easy way to bring all of them together and say this has been the impact of these organizations. And, and I'm sure SB2 struggles with this. How do you compare an educational organization to an environmental organization? Um, each of our organizations develops metrics on their own that is based on their own industry. So we're looking at them in relation to their peers. Um, and then we're tracking um, with them those metrics, and but we're also really tracking organizational metrics with them. Um, hiring a COO, getting systems in place, building out your board, um, getting a phone system in your office. You know, we're, we're really working with them on the things that we think will get them to a point where they're also having the high impact um, results on their program side. Um, our organizations are, this is sort of a silly metric, but it's the only way we can figure out how to do it. But if you look at everybody's top uh, most important program impact metric, and you look at its growth over the life of their time with us, we're seeing about 107% um, uh, year on year average growth. For the finance people in the room, it's a Kager, but it's so they're about doubling their output every year of impact. I don't know if that's important. I don't know. I don't think it is. It's too hard to say that's if it's the impact good, is it bad? Um, but just to relate to you and having a mixed portfolio and what do you do with that and how do you show results, um, we're not sure there's a clean way to do it. And, and we've studied a lot of our peers and with a lot more money than we have and a lot more um, – sort of staff and uh, and they keep they don't do it either so we're trying we're trying to do it um, let's see so our first fund which will close in about um, a year and a half the founders fund was a, it will be a 14 million dollar fund it will fund 30 new nonprofits um, over and it was 10-year fund um, the new fund which for the time being we're calling the innovators fund um, will well, it's, it's in flux, but um, we thought it was going to be a $15 million fund. Now there's some talk about a $25 million fund, but let's say for today, $15 million fund that will be deployed over five years and will fund 30 new nonprofits. 
So that's really exciting. We have been sort of a, a, a closed group of donors to date, just four donors, and then we have a professional staff. Um, and uh, the Innovators Fund will be opened up. Um, but still pretty tight because we want to be able to have the donors really know the entrepreneurs and get to know us. And so it'll be around 15 donors, we think, for a $15 million fund. Um, I'm happy to talk about our annual conference, our interaction, or board service. Um, I sit on about seven boards right now, um, and I'm fine. We have found over the last eight years, um, in the beginning, I, sa I sat on some boards and I didn't sit on some boards. Um, there's quite a bit of controversy in the industry about whether or not it's a good <coughs> idea to take a board seat. Um, my grantees tell me it's a good idea, and I think this is why it works. Um, we're working with startups who really need high engagement and supportive board members. So they need a board member who really gets them, who understands their vision, isn't frightened by growth, and can really help them take some risks. Um, also, it reduces the power of the foundation. So it's always the opposite of what people say. Well, then you've got too much say. But I'm not sure people say that about a donor who sits on the opera board. You don't say, well, you have too much say, right? But I think we forget that donors sit on boards. But, um, you know, when I didn't sit on boards, what happened was the board would come to a conclusion and an entrepreneur would call me and say, we decided to do this. And I'd say, why? Why? What? And then all of a sudden, I'm the big bad funder out there who's like questioning something that they worked really hard to come to the conclusion. Whereas if I'm in the board meeting and there are eight people on the board and we all talk about it together, then I can hear their context, they hear mine, and we come to a decision together. And so I'm one of eight voices. So I actually think having a donor on your board with you brings them closer to you. They understand what, you, what the entrepreneur is going through, and you understand when things go wrong. So when they miss their numbers, I know exactly why. Like, I saw it. I was there. I tried to fix it with them. And so I'm a much more empathetic donor. Um, and you need that... I think you really need that inside look if you're working with early stage organizations because there are not clear metrics and indicators of success. I mean, okay, so they hired a COO. Is it a good COO? Are they working well together? Do they need some coaching? Do they need some different office dynamics? What's happening there? Um, and that really, that high engagement makes you a much more effective donor than if you just saw them once a year or twice a year. And it's really, it's really hard to be both helpful and to be empathetic when, you know. So we always take a board seat now. And we take what we learn from some boards and we bring it to the others. And that's really what's been very helpful. Where, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're all by yourself, and you're saying, how do I know if I'm being successful? Is my board functioning right? I don't know. Is my, are my metrics looking pretty good? Is my, am I on track with staffing? How's my funding pipeline? You know, and then we can sit there and we'd be like, well, you know what, your funding pipeline is seven months long. You better have a two year, two and a half year funding pipeline because you're gonna run out, you know, really just giving them some perspective of folks that we've seen in the past um, and say to them, you're either doing great or yeah, let's concentrate on this piece for a little while. Um, and so we took some of our lessons learned that were in our head and we spent time this summer researching, um, both pulling some metrics from our portfolio and also interviewing um, our portfolio and testing our theories about um, how fast should you go to the next location, um, should you hire a COO early or should you wait, um, things like this. And we, I think we gathered some really interesting data, not just about the when to do things or the what, but also the how. If you're gonna to go to that second location, what should be in place before you go there and who should be there? Um, and one interesting thing we found about second locations is that the, the first time you go to a second location, it's almost always opportunistic. You had you know, a funder there or you had um, a staff member wanted to move there 
or you know your parents live there and so you don't mind visiting all the time and then the second location is strategic so the, you know, I mean your third location so you go to the first one and it's opportunistic and most of the time we're finding that's okay it's good and then the third location you tend to bring in a summer intern and they research the geographies and they study it for you and you turn funders down, no thank you, I really want to go to Ethiopia, no I don't, I want to go to Kenya. And then, so it's that third location that our entrepreneurs are finding is a strategic location. Oh God, I talked too long. Um, so I'm going to stop and I'm going to take questions. Yeah. Well, I'll give you two questions that we won't have to recycle. One, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by sustainable yeah. impact and, and could you get me to a better understanding of why educational enterprises don't fit your model very well. Yeah. Um, by sustainable, we mean, um, most people, um, sustainable ends up meaning that there's recurring revenue that pays for the organization. And we're seeing a, a lot of interest from entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in that area. Um, they tell us, I'm tired of fundraising, right? So they develop models um, that have revenue streams in them. And we don't fund things that have a side business. So they run a program and then they sell chocolate bars, right? That's not interesting. But when it's endemic to the model, um, you know, like the ladies going door to door selling medical products and then Living Goods takes a margin on that, we, we really love those models. But when I said sustainable, I meant that when the organization goes in and does something, something lasting happens. So whether or not somebody's life is transformed, whether somebody has a job, whether um, somebody now has a school to go to, those are um, programs that, that we really look for. And we also look for sustainable organizations that are going to be there serving the beneficiaries for many, many decades, we hope. We've only been around for eight years, so we're not sure yet. Um, knowing that not everybody should be in business forever, but we certainly are interested in entities that hope to be around for a couple decades, evolving their work and serving people in a more effective and efficient way as they go. Um, domestic nonprofits, say, take a charter school or a charter network. Um, we actually would be interested in a charter network if we felt like it was some a new model that hadn't been tried before. Um, a lot of education organizations, by their nature, are local. Like a charter school is very much of that um, group of people. And so our skills really are in sort of building a national organization and thinking about a national board and and growth. And so we would just be in the way in a charter school. Like, you know, I come out of education. I love, I mean, I love it, but for the discipline of our model, we've had to be sort of um, diligent about what we fund in that area and what we don't. Um, we have funded international education. We funded something in the U.S. called um, Education Pioneers, which works very well for our model because it's scalable. It's a limited, very controlled program that iterates every year. It's multi-city. It's not expensive to run. Um, and so with limited resources, you can adapt the model, change it over time, move it from place to place, find good um, people to run it because it attracts um, really skilled managers, which isn't always easy to do if you were starting a school, for instance. Um, and so that, that was a model that worked for us. But I still, I still am always looking. K-12 education is my love, so. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. You talked about some on uh, your portfolio. You have 23 com or 25 companies, uh -huh. 23 of those, three of those which failed. But you talked about how in the summer you kind of started to look at these metrics and some of your other competitors also did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, again, what you see like the top three keys to these companies are? mentioned them. You mean top three so like if you, if, success variables? Right, or? right. If you look at the variables, you, you mentioned that you look, you guys try to come up with some statistically significant variables. Oh, what are we finding are the best yeah. practices? Right, the best practices. Okay, so um, there's one that's a little hard um, 
there's one that's almost impossible to measure, but it's the leadership. So it's all about the person. Um, and in our experience in a startup, the founder has to be the CEO. If the founder is not the CEO, it, it falters. If the founder is the chairman of the board, it will be a local organization. It will be a great local organization, but it will never be Teacher America. I mean, Wendy Kauf had to lead the board, run that thing, and she had to drive it through, and everybody thought she was crazy. Right? And she had a board who said, yeah, you're crazy, but we're going to run with you. Um, and so the leader is really important. Here's some stats that are a little bit disheartening to us because we want to work with younger and younger entrepreneurs. But um, we force ranked our portfolio based on impact and growth. And we have three buckets. We call them our rocket ships, our very goods, and our sideways. And then we had failures. But our failures like died, we got out of there quickly. So sideways basically they're doing good work, but they are not really growing very fast. They're sort of they're doing like I would be proud to put money in them, but they're sort of doing this. Our very goods are there's some promise there. And our rocket ships are, you know, doing this. Um, overall uh, our entrepreneurs have about four years of management experience. Not just work experience, but managing people. Um, of our very goods and sideways, they have about 0.8 years of management experience. And our rocket ships have eight years of management experience. <laughs> so what do you do with that, right? So, okay, so that, that should, that's, that's intuitive, right? They've managed people before. So, I think what it shows you is you have to have the passion and the charisma, but you have to be a manager. So what do you do with that when, when there is a wave of social entrepreneurs coming out of college right now that is like nothing I've ever seen? And I haven't only been in this industry for eight years, but it is, they are not just passionate, they are smart and they are, uh, we just funded a team, if anyone's heard of Global Health Corps, they're not right out of college. Because Johnny Dorsey's like maybe 24, and Barbara Bush is maybe like 27, but they're young. They, their model is refined. It is thoughtful. They have they have solved problems that my portfolio took them five years to figure out, and they already solved it before they started. And so, but I know statistically they're going to be in trouble. So what do I do with them? Um, and really keeping a portfolio that's a mixture of the Chuck Slaughters who started Travel Smith and now started Living Goods and the Johnny Dorseys. And how do you get them together, get them learning from each other, get them an executive coach, get them an executive assistant, right? So how do we sort of do that? And the interesting thing about working closely with social entrepreneurs or any kind of entrepreneurs is that you have to come to them when they're ready. So you can't just tell them you're going to have a coach. It doesn't work. They're going to be like, we can't afford it, and I don't want it, and I'm too busy. They, always, they all say that to me. And I'm like, that's cool. And then like in a year, 18 months, they're like, oh, God, I can't handle it. Oh, this is crazy. And I'm like, do you want an idea? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, how about we try a coach? And so, so it's this. It has to be the right coach. It has to be a fit. It has to be someone who's right for their personality. Or... Hey, let's get you a COO, or hey, let's um, let's have you stop answering the info at emails, right? Oh <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so being patient and meeting them, and you know, what's frustrating is I have a couple of organizations that are so early they don't even have a board. Like I and the entrepreneur are the board, which is not a recipe for success. But they're not ready. They're building their program. They're far away. They might be in the middle of nowhere. And they just now are calling me and saying, I think, I, I think I'm ready to build a board. And I'm like, great. You know, it only took us 12 months, but that's cool, and we'll get there, and you're still doing good work, and I'm watching the shop, and I know it's okay. So some of it is patience and understanding that um, you don't have all the answers, and even if you have an answer, they have to be ready to hear it. Um, so leadership is a big piece of success. Um, you know, people, getting, getting the right people involved um, is a big piece. Um, being a great fundraiser is really important. 
Um, and uh, which people don't like to hear, but you do. You have to be a great fundraiser. And um, uh, what else makes you really successful? Um, having, having something that people are personally drawn to, whether they're donors or volunteers. I mean, nobody knew Kiva was going to do what Kiva's doing. And nobody would have put money into Kiva. So we were the first foundation into Kiva. And... Um, I, I mean, I, I knew there was something there, but I, I have to be honest, like, it's a phenomenon that I do not understand. I, I, do, I don't, because I have to tell you, I'm not the typical Kiva user. I'd be happy to put my, in a group, like, I don't need the one-to-one -one and the, like, but it is, it has gotten more people involved with philanthropy, with the international community, um, and they are constantly um, trying to figure out how to serve and harness this huge group of people who are excited about that. Um, and it has changed, what we love is that it has been paradigm changing. So we constantly get proposals from people who say, I'm building a Kiva-like model, right? It's like a new, you know, and I think that's really, or I'm building a room, like Room to Read has changed the way people do basic international development. They've made it more business-like. They've made it more efficient. They've made it more community-oriented. It's not a new idea. Room to Read is not an innovative, putting a school in a village is like the oldest idea ever. But the way they insist on community involvement, they insist on no graft, they, they, um, they run a very tight ship, they measure what they can measure, and every year they try to get more sophisticated on their measurement, recognizing that counting the schools is not sufficient but sometimes it's the only thing you can do, and then you keep working at that. I think that is changing the way. I remember when I was on the Room to Read board and calling all the big universities and saying, I need to talk to your expert on international de developing world education because we were two or three years old, and we need to know whether or not these kids are really improving their education, their literacy, and, and you know, making their way. And they said, we don't have anyone. Or I call Save the Children and Care, and they'd say, that's great. When you figure that out, could you call us? And I was destroyed, because this is a teeny little startup in San Francisco. And there are all these organizations that have been doing this for decades. And I was shocked that we were the only ones thinking about it. And I think that Room Tree gets a lot of flack, because for many years, they counted results as number of schools and libraries and things like that. But it's not because we didn't try. Like, we really, really tried. And they have had a measurement and evaluation um, head for years now. And they're getting better and better. So I think we're looking for models also that are going to sort of rub some people the wrong way and change things and get people to think about things a little bit differently. Yeah? You talked about bringing the organizations together. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. and I, I guess it's... it's definitely beneficial for them and they want it, so do they develop the, the agenda for that or how does that work? Um, so we convene once a year for about three days um, and it's all current grantees and then alums are also invited. We pay for their travel to come to us and, and to stay with us. Um, how, it, how many people from the grantees do you So we bring just the CEO or the team if it's a pair. Um, and, but maybe three years ago, we invited also their COOs. Um, and I can tell you there were a lot of pros of that and a couple of cons. Um, and each year we changed the format a little bit and we changed the content, definitely changed the content. And there are some topics that are actually really hard to create programming around, like fundraising. Um, and we've had mixed results. Yeah, it's a secret. Um, we actually, our most successful fundraising presentation and workshop was with um, Kay Sprinkle Grace this year. If you ever, she is phenomenal. And our young and wild and crazy entrepreneurs connected with her really well. Um, and she's sort of a traditional stored the donor kind of fundraiser. And they, they just, I mean, they all went home and started, you know, writing personal notes to every donor, and it's, it's amazing. So she was good if you ever need a fundraising person. Um, 
we mm. do um, we do um, topics like scaling. We do topics human resources. We had um, sort of the Salesforce Foundation come in. We've done had an executive coach come in. Everybody's done a 360, and then we do sort of management evaluation of them. Um, and we leave quite a bit of it for um, CEOs in our of our organizations to teach each other. So we pick certain ones that are ex have become experts on certain topics, whether it's not like transforming your board, um, doing a private placement like fundraising round where you fundraise a chunk of money all at once. That was an interesting topic. Um, we this year we had the the young ones in our group decided to. Um, do like a mutiny and they created a, a breakfast they call it tech palooza so everyone like showed up at eight o'clock and they just did Twitter and and you know Facebook and they just showed on uh, things that I'd never heard of where they were showing about how they are communicating with their interns and their donors um, so we're leaving a lot of space for people to create their own content not too much though but um, because we don't it's we value their time very much, and we want them to walk away saying, "Well, that was worth three days of my time." Um, we also have them present, do sort of um, on-the-fly consulting, where they present a challenge that they're having, and then the group does a sort of a quick-fire cons consultation of it. Um, and uh, and then what they ask for is always more semi-structured networking time, always. They want more time to sort of impromptu find each other and say, remember that thing you said about whatever? Um, we always traditionally have had a play day, which is not really, um, I was never really comfortable with. We did it when we just had a few fellows and we'd go to one of my donors' homes mm -hmm. in Sonoma and just hang out for the day. And we kept it because it's the most uh, useful part of the three days. Um, where and it, we've tried it in the beginning and the end. It's better to do it at the end because then they spend two days getting to know each other and each other's problems, and then the third day. But we're not going to do it as a full day this year. We're going to do it as partial afternoons because they were getting tired, and then so it'll be like a nine to two, and then three hours of going for a hike all together or something, and then each day doing it like that. And we'll see. We're always each year tweaking it a little bit. Um, and our fellows really want time with our donors. They really want time with Bill and Robin, and um, we hope in our second fund that's going to be a really great way that our donors interact with our entrepreneurs is at the conference. If you were on Greg Mortensen's board, three cups of tea, uh -huh. what would be the first three things you would tell him to attend to in order to be a long-term sustainable organization? I, I haven't studied his organization since I read the book years ago. So I'm not sure that I would okay. comment. But you mean like an entrepreneur in general? Yeah, I'm just trying to draw you out to sort of yeah. enjoy some thinking of yours and, and sort of like a case study thing. So maybe but, I could pick so some, not Greg, some, something. Yeah, I could pick something in our portfolio. I mean, I could talk about some evolution. Like I was thinking of doing Kiva, but Kiva is quite, um, quite an individual it's a little different. It's more like an internet company, quite frankly, and the board meetings feel more like a. Do one um, of your smaller ones. Yeah. So uh, let's take. Um, um, do you want to hear sort of board meeting interactions, or would you rather hear work with the entrepreneur and evolution of the organization? Yeah. Evolution of the organization. So let's take. Um, Education Pioneers, does that work? So education, Scott Morgan came to us. Um, education Pioneers, for those of you who don't know it, is an um, opportunity for people between their years of graduate school to take an internship in an educational reform organization, like a New Leaders for New Schools, a KIPP, uh, an Aspire Public Schools, for the summer and be part of a cohort that meets every other week to talk about the whole industry and to learn from education pioneers. That's why it's called Education Pioneers. Um, and so Scott was an attorney for Aspire Public Schools. And he said, boy, I really wish that I had had, he went and got his own experience by working at Aspire Public Schools. <coughs> he said, I'd like to create this opportunity for people to, for people who are not 
necessarily already know about education, but they might be law students, business school students, public policy students, to learn about and get a very rich understanding in three months about to, to U.S. education so that they can be more um, engaged um, staff members, uh, board members, volunteers, donors as they go through their lives. And uh, Scott came to us with just a business plan. He hadn't raised any money. Um, and he, um, but it was a model that um, was easy for me to understand because I had been a business school student sort of you know, doing exactly what he was talking about. Um, and he had had a great experience working in an educational reform organization. So he knew the audience really well. And the model to me was easy to take a risk on because it was so, um, it, was, it, uh, it was so easy to move from place to place. You really just needed one or two key staff people in each city and they could run the program until it got big enough that you'd need more. And you could really get a national presence and start to engage national funders and national players in um, big discussions early on. And we're finding that, that our organizations really, if they want any kind of, have any kind of national voice, and then eventually policy voice, you have to have a program that is seen as a national player. Um, and there's too few of them in education. Um, and so um, he started this, and what ended up being sort of his stumbling points were that he would hire a good person in another city, even a great person, but that person couldn't do everything. Like, he could do everything. So you can hire great, so he was in San Francisco, and he was fundraising, running the program, leading the program, you know, picking the fellows, picking the partners. And then he'd hire somebody in New York or Boston, I can't remember what the first city was, and they could do maybe three of the four. Usually fundraising is the thing they can't do. And what we really learned from that is, and so then headquarters is in charge of fundraising for quite a while before you can start to build your local advisory board and you can start to differentiate your staff in that city and have sort of an executive director and a sort of a program person in that city, but that you know, we really learned that there is nobody like the entrepreneur to do everything, which is why we insist that the entrepreneur is the CEO, because inevitably, they, for some reason, unless it's your own and it's your passion, you're not able to pull off that ridiculous feat of doing everything. Um, and so we had to be patient a little bit. And at one point, Scott moved to the third city, I believe it was, and hired somebody in San Francisco to run San Francisco. So that, it was an interesting, so he opened, I think he opened Boston, and then he handed that off, and then his Boston person wanted to move to D.C., so then she moved to D.C. And another interesting organizational development that he experienced was he was always conscious of hiring from within and showing a career path for people. So what, um, and this happened with Taproot Foundation, too, which we funded, the, um, you eventually, as you get larger and more sophisticated, you have people at headquarters that produce program and gather results for the whole network. And so he hired people from within the organizations to take those roles. So Brandon, who ran San Re the Bay Area, now runs um, new markets. So he's the one, I think, opening new markets. Somebody else rose up, I think, Shannon rose up to run the alumni network. And so there was this path for them to be a regional player and then to come up, and he's allowed them to stay in their cities. And now Frances McLaughlin's his COO, who's unbelievable. Um, she was at Broad Foundation and was on his board, and he recruited her from the board to be his COO. I don't know how he did it. And so she runs it out of COO out of Boston. So he was always very good at delegating. He was always very good at quietly hiring the best people. Um, and nurturing them from within to bring a pretty widespread network of people to function really well together. Um, and Scott's fundraising strategy always made me very nervous. His pipeline would be one, you know, so he'd know, you know, it was our money, and then all of a sudden it was like nothing and nothing, and I was like, oh my God, Scott, and then he'd raise a million. 
And I was like, what? And then there'll be nothing, nothing, nothing. He raised six million. So he is not, does not make me very comfortable as a board member in terms of his pipeline, but it always works for him. And so there's this, also this piece of saying, okay, I can, I can warn you that I think that, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket is probably not a good idea. You're going to have to start individual fundraising. But there's also this piece of, at some point, trusting them and saying, this is your baby. You make the decisions. I've told you what I think. I've shown you what other people do. And you're either going to pull it off or you're not. And he pulls it off every time. He does. It's just unbelievable. So they're doing really well. They're doing really well. I think they have like a $6 million budget now. Five, six. I don't know. I can't. I just am baffled. Um, I thought it was going to be sort of like a nice little thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, it sounds like you did a startup or with small budgets of 140, 400. Yeah. <clears throat> have you considered or looked into doing, let's say, an organization that's been around locally for 10 years? Yep. And then wants to scale? Yep. Or that it's already scaled successfully, but wants to go from 20 programs to 50? Um, <clears throat> so the latter is sort of like a new profit land, if you know them in Boston. So they're interested in taking you from maybe a million in revenue to 10 million. So we've definitely decided to stay early. Um, in terms of taking somebody who's been around for 10 years and then says, ooh, I want to scale, mm -hmm. um, we look at those all the time. And we, I don't know if we will ever fund one. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to culturally make that change. You're left with a board that's 10 years old, is locally minded, is very careful with the money, and they will never take the chances that need to be taken. Inevitably, the, the board has gotten stronger and stronger, and the entrepreneur, especially if it's a new, a new a hired ED, they are controlled by the board, and they will not have the chutzpah to do what's needed to be done. Um, there's probably a few that fall into that category that have worked, but it is hard for us to be the kind of high engagement funder we want to be when there's already a huge infrastructure happening and a whole machinery moving. I'm not saying it can't happen. I think it would be, you know, we have something in our organization that sort of maybe was, it was like around the kitchen table for a few years, so I don't know if you count those years, but maybe it was seven Maybe maybe six years, and we really only fund stuff that's three years and under. But this was nominally three years and under. It was very hard. For, it's very hard for them to transition. Well, we have very much the same thing uh, when we are looking at the <coughs> Because we yeah. want to get into their, we want to get into the kitchen cabinet with them. And, that's right. You know, they've already got all this apparatus in place. So while they're saying yes, we want you, they're saying we're we'll calling you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's their beautiful yeah. organizations, but they're not kind of geared for the high engagement of 20 steps that you're trying to do. I think that, yeah, I think that's right. Of course, here I am, eight years old, and I'm going to scale this year. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying it's an impossibility. We just haven't seen, when we have dabbled in that area, it hasn't been successful yet. Um, you talked about the exit strategy with the money is sort of naturally built in mm -hmm. there. It seems like as such an engaged board member, you might need an exit strategy there, too. Yeah, we do. Um, so how does that work when your influence is sort of lessened or gone? Or yeah, so um, what um, a big part of our jobs while we're on the board is to build the board and to get the board active. So, like, when I joined the Kiva board, Kiva is an excellent board. It's filled with just the right people, some venture capitalists, some entrepreneurs, um, and they actually were not that low engagement, but they were, um, they basically just needed a little role modeling. So, and Kiva moves like this. So if, if you, like, if the board chair is not, like, in touch with the entrepreneurs every week, um, the world will have shifted. It's actually a really interesting and very dynamic, most, probably the most dynamic board I've ever sat on. And very complex legal issues and currency issues and fraud issues and you know they have their own in-house counsel like you know and so um so the for a little while i was the most engaged board member and we started talking about 
who we needed on the board, that we needed a board chair that wasn't one of the entrepreneurs. I like the entrepreneur to be the chair at first, but then I like that to sort of shift out after about two years because they start to have too much to do, but I don't mind them being chair at first. And so we talked about how we needed a board chair and how um, we needed a makeup of about seven board members that were high engagement. A board chair that was in the office once a week, you know, because it just is that kind of organization. And there was a little bit of a implication that if you're not going to be that kind of board member, you're not going to be asked back um, in a very nice way by modeling. You know, like by my showing what kind of board member I thought they needed um, and then saying we're going to really think about who's going to sit around this table, they all stepped up to the table because it, they are all passionate about it. They all put money in early and when nobody else would. These are all individuals who are individual checks, so they really believe in Kiva. And they have all stepped up to the table. Now we have some committees. I'm not big on committee structure. We can talk about that. But there are some specific things where one or two people have to be looking at something very closely for a <coughs> short amount of time and then get rid of the committee, I think. Um, but that people are really engaged in twos and threes between board meetings, and that has been really successful. So getting there and doing some role modeling, set, role modeling setting expectations um, can really be helpful to your CEO. <laughs> And, and supporting the CEO. And sometimes our CEOs think that we're, um, well, they're, they're always so nice to us, but I think sometimes they think we're sort of a pain in the ass because we're like, okay, how's that fundraising going? You know, how's that COO search? You know, we're, we're not exactly just like, you're so great. You know? So, but I think in the end, we try to come up with solutions together and try to back off when we feel like, you know, it's not working. Um, can you talk a little bit more about due diligence process? You mentioned yeah. sort of some of the things you look for, but how do you actually draw that out within the six to one month, six months to a year? And then also on the programmatic side, since you know if you have limited staff, where do you get that expertise? How do you package it? Yeah. <clears throat> on the programmatic side, we lean on um, folks like Hewlett, actually, and um, um, and we sort of have networks at um, all the big foundations and um, universities and um, um, people, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Draper was undersecretary of the UN for eight years and so we've sort of tapped that network and really try to talk to people who are either practitioners or study the space or have already invested in the space. Um, and continue and continue to ask questions until the nagging questions go away or, or they don't go away. Um, and uh, in terms of really getting to the heart of, are you saying like how do you interview the entrepreneur so that you get to the, like the core of the or issue? Is it, is it just sort of six months of interviewing? Do you like yeah. how much process? Is yeah, so um, we start the process with a, uh, we're an open foundation, anybody could apply to us. We feel like that's important. Um, and it's a three-page proposal with a series of questions that we found over time tell us a lot about how you think as an entrepreneur. And we also asked for a resume. The resume was an addition that we added later, which helps us sometimes do a quick check if the person has any relevant data. Like sometimes you'll see an idea and you're like, that's interesting. And then you'll see the person is a dog walker in Wichita and they're trying to do gene therapy, right? And like, you're like, oh, no. They're just like good at writing a proposal. Or the opposite, they write sort of a convoluted proposal and then they're like, oh my God, look what they've done, okay. right? And then you're like, I'll, I'll do a call with them. So then we do a call with about 30%. We see about 400 proposals a year. We do uh, initial calls with 30% of those, and then um, we continue down the road. Sometimes we'll say, do you have a three-year budget? And that tells us a lot about resource allocation, how they think about, um, how they think about growth, how they think about, you know, and then sometimes they send it to us and it's like, well, it's 150,000 this year, next year, and that year, and, and they're gonna hire only one other person. And so then we understand that they're not, you know, a fit for us. Or if they have a business plan, we'll ask for that. Um, over, this, over the due diligence period, we, we do ask them to write, and we call it all different things, 
strategic plan, operations plan. We're not looking for a big fan. We actually don't love these like ones that come out of the business plan competitions because they're, we'll read them, but they're very pretty, but they're over-processed and they're unrealistic. Like don't look at anybody's SROI on a startup. It's like, right, I mean, how do you know? Um, so I prefer something where the person really, um, and I also don't expect it to take a long time because I think that an entrepreneur who says, well, I have to go to my board and then we have this writer who's going to write it for us and this, like I want my entrepreneur to have been thinking about this every minute of every day and all they'd have to do is write it down and it doesn't have to be pretty, but I can really get a sense of what their vision is, where they're going, and whether or not they have the instincts about how to build an organization. They may have never done it, they may, may have never built a board, but they'll say to you, I think it would be really great to have a board member who's done, you know, something like a Unilever overseas where they have multi-country and you're like, oh, interesting. Like, their mind just, you know, um, get stuff even if they haven't experienced themselves they know they know that they need the answers and then they're going to be the ones that are successful um, and so doing that process is really great for us because they're they either have or are revising a plan or they're writing one and then they send it to us and we ask them questions about the plan and sometimes they'll go back and do whole new thinking on it and we watch them do that we watch how they um, they gather data. We watch how they make tough choices. Generally, um, a very, very good entrepreneur will come to you with one idea. A pretty good entrepreneur will come to you with multiple ideas. And if they can get that down to one idea, um, a simp in my opinion, a simple idea, um, um, the, it, it can have complicated, you know, I mean, but, but seriously, they're really, they're a startup. You can only really do one thing well. And so it's interesting to watch them make those tough choices. They have three friends on the board. Can they make that tough choice? Three staff people on the board. How do they think about governance? How do they make tough choices with their current employees? Um, we had somebody who had a partner who went a little like crazy on him and was going to sue him. And how did he handle separating from her and making choices that he will have to make down the road many times over? Um, like I interviewed, you know, an entrepreneur sat down with me one day and we were going through the proposal. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Could you tell me about this? And what about back on page two? And he was like, can I finish my presentation? Yeah. And I was like, oh. interesting, a linear thinker, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, and I'm really, really straightforward. So I usually will tell people like this meeting's not going well. Like, I would like you to be a little bit more flexible because if you're going to have to be flexible with other donors, and by the way, other partners, so can you do that? And seeing whether or not they can adapt in situations. Um, and for me, another really, really big piece is does the person have a, a um, I don't know, how to, like a golden heart? You know, do they, do you get that sense that you'd like them in your family, that they, they would make the right choice every time. They would, they would never put themselves above their beneficiaries, that you could trust them. You, I can put them with my other cherished entrepreneurs that I adore, and, they're, and it's trusted. Like they, They're going to have an interaction that's not selfish or self-involved, that it's going to be about the greater good. Um, and that's why I went into this industry, and so it's wonderful to be able to pick these amazing people and have that as a choice. How do you learn about your um, applicants, or how do your applicants learn about you? Uh, how do you find, you know, how do you first find the connect with the gems? Yeah, um, we have been a very, very quiet foundation. Um, I have an advertising background, and I've never used it for <laughs> Draper Richards. <laughs> I think at first I was like, well, I don't know how to do this, and I'm not gonna, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna be an, you know, and I. Um, and, um, and then I was like, oh, I hate all those people with all there. We're so great and we're so good. And so I'm not sure. I honestly don't know how anybody finds us because um, I assume nobody knows who we are. But people do find us because they will find you if you have money. Right? I mean, it's not, you know, that's just sort of the way it goes. And um, 
they learn, but our really good ones come through referrals. Yeah. It's, it's just like venture. So they come from other foundations who don't fund early, but they'll, they'll say, oh, that's interesting. Have you heard of Draper Richards? They come out of things like Echoing Green, because um, we tend to, um, we have funded some of the stuff um, either before or after Echoing Green. Ashoka funds after us. We're sort of a feeder to Ashoka. Um, we, um, uh, our entrepreneurs are often referring entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs, the good ones, will go to successful entrepreneurs and say, can I talk to you? I have an idea. And then um, they'll send them to us if they think that they're good. Uh, and we're actually really, um, we're pretty quick at looking at something. So we're not afraid for anybody to send us anything. People say, oh, I don't know if this is right for you. I'm like, I don't care. Send it to me. Because really quickly, I can look at something. We do very graceful rejections, I think. Um, you know, we, we, we answer everybody. We talk to anybody. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's really word of mouth is the best way. But you can apply through our, through our web, just sending us a proposal through our process. All right, last question. For a very successful eight-year run here, what are some of the challenges that you've gone through um, that we might be over um, you know, I, I struggle every day with whether or not we're making the right decisions. I, and, and I have a new partner, Christy Chen, just joined us um, from Philanthropy Workshop West. And I was telling her the other day, which shocked her, I said, there's not been one grant in our portfolio that I was 100% about. Um, because it's, it's gray, right? I mean, it's... It's risk, it's, we call it smart risk taking, but it's risk taking. And so sometimes you just have to be comfortable with the fact that you're making the best decision you can with the information you have, and then you have to put a lot of work into it and try to make connections. So I think that's been hard for, I think that's hard um, to not have, I, I don't know if there's anything in my work where I have, like a, I definitely know I'm doing the right thing at any one moment. When I'm talking to you know to an executive director and advising them, or adding somebody to a board, or picking a new grant, I, I never totally know whether or not I made the right decision. And that's the I mean you have to be comfortable with that, or you you shouldn't do early stage, or maybe not even philanthropy, right? <laughs> you should be like an accountant or something. <laughs>